This video is heavily experimental, and I'm mostly talking about game dev, but it does apply to pretty much all programming. Game dev itself is very good for learning programming because of the very tangible results you get from the code you write. In this video, I'll be trying to teach the process that you have to go through when writing code for yourself, more specifically adding certain features and stuff like that, rather than just copying other people. This is actually very fundamental to coding, but I've never really seen it taught anywhere. In general, this is actually best learned through practice, which you'll get by coding, obviously. However, you can only get the experience in that if you know what to be doing. I see a lot of people avoiding doing things the way that you learn from, and part of the goal of this video is to basically just tell people to stop. So the process for programming is just breaking down a feature into smaller logical chunks until you can break it down to the point where it's basically code or basically pseudocode. This may sound abstract to some or obvious for others, but a lot of people miss this concept. A lot of people will try to look up tutorials for pretty much anything they want to implement when that really shouldn't be the case. There's a certain category of things that I think you should be learning from tutorials and stuff like that, such as the basics of using your library or engine or whatever. But once you're putting things together, I don't think you should be using tutorials as much. Maybe if you're stuck, but ideally you do everything yourself where possible. It makes for a better learning experience and helps you do that even more so in the future. And similar to that, a lot of people seem to think that being good at game development means understanding your engine very well and knowing how to use all of its functions and everything, but that's really not true. You can just know the basics and get a pretty long way. The most important part is knowing how to put things together. You can know all the features of a library or engine without being able to make a game entirely on your own. It's more about learning that process. As mentioned earlier, this is best learned through practice so I will provide examples so you know what this looks like. Examples I'll use here will be very simple, but the thought process can be built up to make much more complex features. I use this thought process for pretty much everything I make, from coming up with at least portions of cloth physics, to animating grass that physically interacts with the player, and things like infinite world generation, stuff like that. So let's start simple. One question I've seen was, how would you add a coin system so that the coin disappears when the player collides with it? So there's two parts to this question. One is a coin system, and two is coins that disappear when you touch with them. Like I said earlier, you really just have to break this down into the logical parts so that you can write the code for it. So with coins, all you really have are a list of objects that exist at a location. Generally, they don't move around too much. They are shown on the screen at that location. And in the case of this question, when you touch the coin, it goes away. So this is a very simple question. There's not too much to break down here. But when you have a list of something, typically you'll use an array or at the list in ca the case of Python to store all of those objects. And you can just represent those objects. Like I said, it exists at a location. So you can represent that as just an X and a Y value. And then there's the part I said where you have to render it. So all you have to do is draw that coin image at the location of the coin which you can just do by iterating over your array or list of coins and rendering that coin at the location that that coin is at according to the data you have. The next part is making it disappear when you touch it. This is pretty simple. You can do the mathematical part where you ch calculate the distance between say the player and the coin or some libraries or engines will have features for collision detection. So you just check if the player has collided with the coin and then like the question states, you want to make it disappear. The disappearance is just removing it from the list of coins that you have. Because if you think about it, you're rendering every single one of your coins from that list every frame. So if it's not in that list anymore, it's effectively gone. You could also just add to a variable that's your 
coin counter if you wanted to do something like that too. I actually did a video on objects and collisions in Pygame. Well, two separate videos. So here's another one. Do you know how to add wall jumps and double jumping? This one is really good for breaking down this process. So let's start with the wall jumps. What is a wall jump? Well, it's kind of in the name. You want to make it so that if you're touching the wall, you get an extra jump essentially, or you're allowed to jump, not necessarily an extra jump. So what is jumping then? Well, jumping is the upward velocity that occurs after you press a button typically. So say you press up and then you'll jump. So what you're looking for in this case is that when the player presses up, if they're on the wall, this is just for a case of wall jumping. I'm not talking about the rules from jumping from the ground. If you're on the wall and you press the up key, your velocity will go up. Now, detecting if you're on the wall is another story. Typically in 2D rectangle-based collisions, you'll handle the movement on the X and Y axis individually, so you know what direction you came from when you collide. I actually have two videos on this concept. I recommend the latter, but they're my physics video, my main series, episode number three, and I did a more detailed physics video to break down how that works. Anyway, so you can take that value where you're calculating what direction you're collided with, because you have to know that direction to correct the player's position to keep them outside of that object they're colliding with. But yeah, you just take that direction and say if it's on the right or left, you're touching the wall. So you store that in a variable, it could just be boolean, true or false, and when the player presses up, you just check that variable to see if they're on a wall, and if it's true, you allow the velocity to go up. Double jumping is a bit different. Double jumping is just exactly what it says, though much like wall jumping in a sense. You get to jump twice. So if you want to allow someone to do something twice, you just have a counter for how many times they're allowed to jump. Every time you jump, you subtract from that counter. And if you want your jump count to reset, say if you touch the ground, you set that counter to two once you're on the ground. And if your counter is less than or equal to zero when you press up, you don't allow the jump. That one can be broken down as just the number of jumps you have and the rules for resetting that count, which in most cases is touching the ground. Touching the ground is a similar to story to the touching the wall thing that I just went over. Now here's a bit of a different one. This is much more visual. Someone was just asking me about how I do uh, shockwaves in my games. He was referring to this effect that I have in my games where I've got a circle that pulses outward, it thins out and disappears. This one is pretty simple in concept. We've got a circle that starts as kind of a point, then it expands, but also gets thinner as it expands. And once the width of the circle's border is zero or less, you just remove it. So breaking this down a bit further, we need a value that represents the radius of the circle. We need a value that represents the width of the circle. And obviously the circle exists at a location, so we need a value that represents the position of the circle. You might also want other values like the color of the circle as well. Anyways, using these values, we can just update them every frame to change the status of the circle effect. So the width of the circle's border will be reduced by a certain amount every frame, and then the radius of the circle will be increased every frame. So all you have to do is just draw circles at varying border widths and radii. That's pretty much it for the examples. Hopefully that gives you an idea of how you might break things down logically. One step that I can't really teach you in this video because it's specific to languages is how to convert the basic logical chunks that make up a feature into the code itself. That's something you have to do by learning the language itself. And sometimes people will ask me questions like these examples that I brought up in this video and I'll break them down to the point I did in this video to some extent and they'll still be confused and at that point if they're confused I would just say that they need to be more familiar with the language they're using or they need to move to simpler problems. In general it's just best to start small doing things that don't seem too intimidating build up your ability to follow this process and implement that in to code and then eventually you'll be able to implement almost anything you want. Anyways that's pretty much it for this video. If you have any questions you can
can head over to my Discord server. I've got a channel dedicated to questions there. I'm also working on a devlog series if you're interested in my projects, or you can check out my Twitter where I post fairly regular updates on my projects. Hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video.